reports have emerged from Magui County, Eastern Equatoria State, that communities are being overrun by cattle and cattle herders heavily armed from Jonglei State. Join us as we discuss this and more only on Beyond the Headlines. Before the breakdown of the looming crisis in Eastern Equatoria State, we're joined by Mr. Edmund Yakani, the Executive Director of Community Empowerment for Progress Organization, abbreviated as CEPO. Thank you for coming on the program. Thank you. Thank you for hosting me for this particular disturbing issues where we're losing the lives of our communities and their properties because due to either cattle raiding or armed clashes. We appreciate you being here. It has been reported that a youth from the Agora community in Magui was recently killed by cattle herders. There has been an exodus of the civilian population within the state from their homes as they seek shelter. What is the current situation in Magui between the cattle herders and the community? The situation is tense as we're speaking for now in the sense that we have lost the life of young people or youth, more than 20 were killed and we have a bit of a hundred families displaced to Magui County headquarters. And uh, the level of fear among the communities being herders and pastoralists is very high because the host communities, which are actually in Magui, they're not armed, they're past their farmers. So it's a season they're preparing themselves to farm, but now they're confronted with armed herders, which mainly come from Bor, and they're armed and the aggression between the two communities competing over the use of land for farming and cattle grazing is becoming more tense. And I've led to this level of where violence is now going on and we have lost lives and we have huge displaced number of people to the county headquarters in Magui. So that is what is now going on. And besides that, it has turned to become now a complete national political issues between the sons and the daughters of the host community against the sons and the daughters of the armed herders. Uh, who are the owners of these cattle that are permitted to freely roam in Eastern Equatoria? Because it has been alleged that high ranking military as well as politicians are owners of these cattle. Obviously, we need to qualify the names in terms of the ownership of the cattle. But what I can confirm to you per my data, per my survey as working with the communities in Magui is that top generals who are in our uh, army forces are the owners of these cattle, and some of them are politicians in the current government. And their names is popping up on the ground. So what I can use for now is to say high level politicians and generals are the real owners of these cattle. And this can be proved by the nature of the arms that the cattle herders are carrying in their hand. They're carrying model weaponry, which was just recently purchased by our government. So in the hands of the herders, plus AK-47, which was most used everywhere among pastoralist community. So that is the disturbance is that some leaders, both politically and militarily, are the rightful owners of the cattle. And they're the same people who we expect to make a decision for creating uh, what we call peaceful coexistence between the herders and the pastoralists. One could argue that the cattle herders from Jonglei and other areas have been going to Equatoria region to ensure that their cattle get the greenery that is needed to survive. And this has been ha happening for decades. So what's the difference now for them taking on the initiative of ensuring their cattle survival by going to Equatoria region? What is the history? The history is that it has never happened an influx of such huge number of cattle coming from jungle estates and going to Eastern Equatoria and specifically the triangle between the Acholi and the Madiland or what do you call Magui County or sometimes we describe it as a Juba Nimule road. So due to the crisis, there are few cattle herders who are mainly from Jongole who are able to make up or were able to possess cattle, mainly within the host community due to the history that most of the jungle community state in Eastern Equatorial and Nimule, specifically Nimule, so they're able to build up in raising cattle, mainly either from 
cattle keepers from Uganda, but their numbers are not as much as the current one. The current one is a real huge influx. And what I can describe to you that you can see them coming from Bor in motorboats. They are put in, in motorboats from Bor and then brought to Juba and then Juba put in a trucks and then driven down to Magui, to Pangeri, to Achoa, to all the Made and the Acholi land. And this tells you that actually the people who are behind moving these cattle from Jongole to the ground to Eastern Equatoria are not simple people. These are people who are wealthy. These are people who have money. And you can see almost everybody going behind the cattle are armed. And this qualifies or describes that the actual owners of the cattle are not the armed herders. The own owners are actually in the government. And so they need to make a decision. But the history is that it has never happened in history that a such big number of cattle have inflated or have moved to the site of Mati and Acholi land in a specific and this particular season, which is a rainy season, a cultivation season for the pastoralists from Mali and Acholi. So, and of course, other factors that, in, that have impacted is a climate change. You are aware that among the climate change implications of land is that one of the states like Jongole is flooded. So most of the herders, they have to leave Jongole and get displaced because of the floods, move to highlands. And Eastern Equatoria, the Mali and the Acholi land is a non-flooded area, is a highland. So they're coming, moving away from jungle escaping floods and escaping the death of the cattle. That's what, what, I, what I can say. But also because of the floods, the cattle keepers in jungle estate are exposed to one of the very terrible raiding community called the Murle. So they move to the highlands, the Murle take advantage to raid them. So also the escaping floods, but also the escaping the raiding of the Murle. But now the problem is that the cattle herders are armed and they tend not to respect the traditional norms of the areas where they're hosted, which is mainly the Madi and the actual land. These are farmers who have no cattle, so they need to farm. So they're competing over the small piece of land under what is described as saved and protected land under the, the protection of the state. So that small land that is protected by the state, all of them are competing over using it for farming and for grazing. And that's where the problem started. You mentioned that um, when it comes to the transportation of the cattle, they're transported by river boats from Jongle, they arrive in Juba, and then they're put on lorries and transported to the various equatorial um, uh, areas like um, communities. How long do the cattle tend to stay in those areas? Is it only during the dry season? This is one of the things that as an activist working around it is that is there any formal or informal arrangements between the host communities and the owners of the cattle? in the sense that when water subsides in Bor or in Jongole in general, are they ready to return? Because that's one of the things we need to find out as a question, as an activist. And as I'm speaking with you, I'm going to move to Magui and to speak to the cattle herders and to the farmers to see amicable way of managing that. But besides that also is that they are competing over a small piece of land. Then the next question is, can the cattle herders move away from the farming lands and move to areas where farmers are not farming, they're not farming. And then that's so that they can keep that little time, they can stay there as waiting for the water of the flood subside in jungle estate. Those are of the key critical questions that require an answer. And this will require an answer from the state. It requires state strategy. It requires state policy on how to manage this. But unfortunately, as I say, the biggest problem that is disturbing us that those who are supposed to develop uh, or those who are supposed to create answers as a government officials for responding to this issue of the cattle herders are the same people who own these cattle herders sometimes, some of them, not all of them, some of them. But this is where also the confusion in terms of making a decision that can be effective. Remember, His Excellency the President have issued a lot of presidential decrees for movement of cattle out of farmlands to their original lands, but that particular presidential decrees are not being executed simply because the cattle herders are not the real armed herders who are going behind the cattle. The owners are the same people who are supposed to execute the presidential decrees, but they refuse because they know the risk either the cattle are going to face the floods or the cattle are going to be raided. And they feel that living in an area like Magui or the Acholi land or the Mati land, it will really, it really reduce the level of they being exposed for raiding. But remember also, in Eastern Equatoria, we have other more than four or five communities who are cattle keepers who are ready to come and raid. And this is the fear. The future fear is that besides the tension between the Acholis as the farmers as from Bor, we may see other ethnic groups of Eastern Equatoria, like the Dinga, the Lotuko, and the Toposa, and even Murle, may come and raid. And that become a battlefield. Mm -hmm. What is the governor of Eastern Equatoria State, Governor Louis Lobon, doing to protect his constituents. What is the governor telling the people in Eastern Equatoria when they raise concerns about the rising security problem? 
and the displacement of the community due to the cattle herders and their cattle. Has the governor taken any steps to address the issue with the government or is he fearful of the government itself? Of course, uh, his, uh, his Excellency Governor Lobong Luis Lojore try his level best by moving from the from the state headquarters from Toriti came down to Magui and he spoke to the uh, cattle herders camp leaders and he told them like harmony is the most important respect the traditional norms and ethics of living in this area this area belong to farmers and you're displaced because of floods so you need to respect the traditional norms and harms and live in harmony with them though you're armed don't really weighs it as a source of violence. And of course, he is concerned about the presence of huge number of armed cattle herders moving in the communities. He's concerned because that creates insecurity and create fears to the host communities. So one of the challenges that His Excellency Governor is facing is balancing between responding to the interests of the armed cattle herders and the host communities. And of course, the host communities say like, look here, our lives are under threat by having these huge armed cattle herders that they can't entertain dialogue. Whenever I want to talk to them, they threaten us because of the arms in their hands and we're not armed. So Governor Luis Lobongo, you have to balance that by making sure that he negotiates for the cattle herders. What I know in his visit, one of his proposal that he proposed a solution is to move the cattle out of the farmlands and leave the farmland for the farmers to farm because it's agricultural season, remember, if the farmers didn't farm in Magui, and Magui is actually acting as a food basket for certain amount of food in the country. So if the farmers in Magui cannot farm because of the presence of the armed cattle herders, then food insecurity is going to increase. And remember, South Sudan is facing hunger because of the floods. And besides that, one of the main reasons that have brought hunger in South Sudan is this continuous deadly armed communal violence between pastoralists or pastoralists and farmers. So it means we're going to have a Western security situation. But also with Mr. Bongo Jore couldn't resolve this problem because as I say, the owners of the cattle are not simple people. So those who are keeping the cattle on the ground may not listen to him because some of the bosses who are in Juba are the owners, whether in the security or in the political affairs, they are the owners of the cattle. But Lobong have to balance his interest between respecting his counterparts at the national level and the security institutions who are the real owner of the of the cattle and speaking to the to the to the cattle camp leaders on the ground. But to the best of my knowledge, even retired generals from the army, from the hardest community are on the ground. They're staying in the camps. So this tells you it's not easy for you to just go and move them. It means confrontation will be there. And remember with pastoralists, as long as the cattle is at risk, the whole life of theirs is at risk. And this means they're ready to pay any price to make sure the cattle stay safe. And one of the price they can pay is that they're ready to confront whoever will face them. And they're also aware that they're going to West to Eastern Equatoria is an area that potentially they may confront opposition, a hold out groups that might have not send a peace agreement. So they went well armed. The question is, where is the role of the state? And Lobong have to balance and have to find answer to that. And I, what I know to the best of my knowledge is that he is summoned by the Council of States to answer some questions around the questions where that you have raised and providing an answer. So Lobong likely may appear in the government in Juba under the Council of States to answer some questions around his strategies to mitigate this. But I think shouldn't be Lobong alone. Also the governor of Jongole State, His Excellency, Denai Jok should be summoned to Juba by the Council of State so that they can provide a joint solution as the two governors of the states where their committees are in tension over the use of land in Eastern Equatoria and specifically in Magui land. It is interesting that you stated that there are some generals who are already in the cattle camps in Eastern Equatoria that is quite concerning. So it means that they are prepared for anything. Obviously, obviously, these are not um, uh, normal generals. They are known in our history of the struggle for 21 years when they're struggling with Sudan. So they're now on the ground. And of course, partly they are also the owners of this cattle. So, so one of the things also I can clarify is that the owners are not only leaders in Juba, whether in the political, in the, you know, in the security institution, but also there are some generals who have moved together with their cattle. And you know, one of the biggest things that maybe to share with the audience, the value of the cattle for a cattle keeper is a bank. It's like all the deposits, all his capital is in the cattle. So the lives of the cattle is so important for a cattle herder of a cattle keeper because everything is in the cattle. So they have to move behind the cattle because the cattle define what is called wealth. And the only way to protect the wealth is to be armed because this wealth can be easily be raided or be attacked. So the only way you can do that is for you to arm to yourself to the teeth and confront anybody and sacrifice your life to keep your wealth. According to Otto David Ramson, 
the commissioner of Magui County in Eastern Equatoria State, the invasion by the cattle herders has led to the displacement of 5,445 people. In a statement to iRadio, he stated, since yesterday, Sunday, we have registered 909 households and the total population is 5,445 and above. And still RRC is making the registration. What are, environmental, what are the environmental and societal effects that the cattle and the cattle herders are having on the communities in Eastern Equatorial State apart from the displacement, apart from the inability to utilize their land for agriculture. What are some of the adverse effects the communities are experiencing? Obviously, environmentally, the cattle herders have to establish a camp. And establishing a camp, they have to clear a certain amount of a bush. And in clear that bush, they have to clear certain trees. And that means they expand the chances of deforestation in the community by having establishing a camp that they can keep the cattle, but also they need a fuel in order to keep the environment where the cattle are warm in order to deter insects that may be harmful to the cattle. So it means they will be moving to the bush to cut certain trees for fuel in order to burn it within the cattle camp. That's one thing that they can do for the environment. In terms of farming, they may affect the farm areas or the farm ground. So farmers cannot farm very well because the movement of the cattle destroy the quality of the soil. Besides, we know that they can help in manure, but they need to be in an organized and a very scientific way. But besides that also, if you're planting things like cassava, the movement of the cattle may not allow the cassava to survive. But if you plant any type of crops like maize or sorghum, the cattle can depend and actually they tend to depend on the cassava leaves or depending on uh, maize and sorghum leaves more than the natural grass. So it means the cattle have interest to go to the farms. And that means agriculture season may not succeed. So those are all impact and food insecure impact that will affect the community. And that means the livelihood of the farmers that is much more depending on farming may become a problem. And this means socially, the element of social cohesion may break down. So we may have a breakdown of the social fabric for peaceful coexistence between the herders and the farmers. The only thing is that they have to confront themselves and each one have to die. Farmer have to die in order to have an access of land to farm and pastoralists is ready to die in order to have land for cattle grazing. So land become a goal that class between farmers and pastoralists for its usage for either farming crops or for grazing cattle. And that means everybody is ready to die for it. Mm. Um, there have been some members of the Boer community who have stated the cattle and their herders should be permitted to move and even resettle in any part of South Sudan, citing that the country belongs to all citizens. Thus, no tribe has a sole ownership of their land. Uh, what do you say to that? And what has been the response to such statements from the government of Eastern Equatoria State? I have such statement, it is, uh a statement that triggers violence in terms of it's a hostile propaganda. It may be even treated as a hate speech because our identity is identified by land ownership. Our identity is not identified by anything. Today, I will be identified as Edmond Yakani. I'll be identified by my land, where I come from. That's my identity. So land is an identity. So you can't take somebody's identity anyhow like that. Though the law say the land belongs to the government, what does it mean? It means we have procedures and process to acquire the land. But now if you start moving to ancestral land, which is actually ancestral owned, because today, if you ask, remember, what, maybe what I can bring is that when we were struggling for the independence of South Sudan, during this first peace agreement negotiation between the SPLA and the government of Sudan, one of the biggest issue is how do you define the land of South Sudan? So the identity aspect was used for defining the land of Sudan, and specifically where we have a BA is disputed. So by then, the leader of the SPLA and the chairman of the SPLA, late Dr. John Garang, have to use the praise, the land belong to the community. So the praise of the land belongs to the community is an identity issue of like, what is a land that we can identify as an identity of so-called South Sudanese or the tribes or African tribes below the Southern part of Sudan by then. So land was used to define what exactly define the Republic of South Sudan. So land is an identity issue for us. So that, that particular statement is a statement that is pro-violence, is a statement that you won't force people. Yes, the land need to be governed by the government. And the government governed the land through a policies and through a law. So nobody can claim to access a land. 
ask yourself today if we go to the, this particular people or these particular individuals who say that the land belongs to everybody if you come to contest if you want to contest in elections where is your constituency your constituency you have to go back to where you are or you register in a constituency of other people that you can't contest in it but you register to go for it so it's a it's it's a, it's a notion of some people who want to distort the element of identity and remember in South Sudan, we're living in a nation where there's no common identity. The only identity you can identify yourself, it's the land that you belong to. That's why sometimes when people ask you, who are you? I say, my name is Edmund. They say, where you come from? Then I have to refer to the land where I'm coming from. And that land is named in a political name, for example, as my county. So the name of my county is my identity, not South Sudan. So it's a bit problematic. And I think it's a sentiment of politicians who are pro-violence. I'd like you to respond to the following statement that Michael McQuay, the Minister of Information, who also happens to be the chairman of the Boer community, recently made. He issued a warning to government officials from Jonglei who own the cattle to have them returned to Boer area. So Michael McQuay said the following, you intellectuals, the reason why cattle are here is because of you. Every time we meet to discuss the issue of cattle, we all agree to take them back to board. But after the meeting, you go and say different things. Me personally, I don't need this cattle to be here. They must be taken back to board. When some of you say cattle should be taken back to board, some of you say, why should we go? Yes, the constitution says any South Sudanese has the right to live anywhere in South Sudan. Don't be misled by this statement. Yes, it says so, but you must remain in your place of birth, just to let you know in advance, please advise cattle keepers to live voluntarily now before they are driven by force. Forceful expulsion will come with huge consequences. It is a great statement. It can be translated to an action and it can be taken seriously. As he said, remember, he quote, you intellectuals. That means intellectuals are the rightful owners of those cattle. And intellectuals, you can define them as politicians. Intellectuals can define them as a generals in various security institutions. And what McQuay was appealing is that remember that you need to go back to your area of birth. Why area of birth? Because that's your identity. And he was trying to give an interpretation of the provision that the land belong to the community or the land belong to the government or the land belong to the South Sudanese. Yes, the land belong to, but this land is not a queen or you cannot obsess this land illegally this land you need to follow certain procedures and i'll give an example i i worked in a case study that i was directly involved in western Baragazali state where we have to make an agreement between pastoralists from tonch and the farmers communities in western Baragazali. there's something called marial by agreement marial by agreement it's an agreement that creates an understanding between the pastoralists and the farmers for certain season for migration of cattle, like how cattle migrate. So in that agreement, there's a prior migration dialogues where the host community will tell the farmers, yes, we know your areas are very tough. You need to come to our area to graze and you can't come and graze in our areas during farming season. You come to graze in our area after harvest season. And if you're coming to graze, graze in this area, because also the cattle done act as a manure, by the way, you know that. So they allow the cattle to graze in one area Next year, they come and graze a different area because it improved for them the quality of the soil. But that is a formal arrangement. That does not mean because the land belongs to South Sudanese, then you are ready to come in anywhere. So the question is, you need to have negotiation, proper arrangement. Of course, we have natural factors that affects them, like the floods, but there's a need to arrange that in a formal way. Mm -hmm. So my okay. crazy statement, I hope will be taken. Mm -hmm. uh, if the issue is not resolved, between the communities and the cattle herders, is there the potential of the escalation of the situation into a full-blown conflict? Likely the territory where this tension is taking place is a bit sensitive. It's within the bell of Equatoria. It's within a bell that easily anybody can declare revolution. 
And actually, even the people are asking, will are this only kettle herders game or an objective behind it? Of course, I have no accurate answer to answer these, but some people feel that it's, this thing is beyond having an armed kettle herders. Maybe some people are doing some dirty game behind, which I don't want to level kettle herders to be seen here as a offering a security threat to the country. What I know is that they're moving away from the floods because floods force them to move away. But the question is a coordination behind that. But likely, if this tension continue and armament flow into the hands of the farmers, likely it will blow a complete tension. And remember, it's not new in our history. Similar situation has happened in Mundri in 2004. Similar situation happened in, in Western Equatoria in Yambio in 2005. We don't want that history to repeat itself in Magui because likely, and remember, it's a border area. And then if you talk of Magui, they actually, and the man is not only in South Sudan, they are also in Uganda. And in Uganda, they're not only a normal citizen. They're within the law enforcement agencies and the security and the military institution. Likely, you may see the Middle East where Sunni and the Shia from different countries have to help each other in other countries to help. So likely, it may blown to a full, big, violent situation that the government may not manage. And I'm, and I'm sharing with you, like a week, a week ago, a cattle herders move away from Magui, and they went to a Jumani area in Uganda. They raided 72 cattle from Uganda, and the Uganda government have to respond. So they raided whose cattle? They raided the same ethnic groups who are in South Sudan that occupying the line, who occupied the land in Uganda, they raided their cattle. So that likely it may generate a common interest that actually cattle herders are now a risk to us, being as farmers in South Sudan of the same ethnic group, or we in Uganda who are keeping cattle from the same ethnic group, we are at risk of this. So likely you may generate a full blown violent situation that we may one day term it as a genocide. Do you think there's the potential of the Equatorians in the government or also in the military to arm the civilian population to protect themselves? Obviously, when the issue become lose of land and lose of identity from that concept, likely politicians who are coming from that region or from that land may take side with the communities if they feel that they're losing their land, if they feel that land is identified as identity, land is identified as a resources, and losing land, it means you're displaced. And remember, the human migration history is not very far, it's close in history. So if you go back to human migration history, somebody saying we need to resist this, we don't allow this, otherwise we may not own this land one day, one time, we may find ourselves displaced. So based on those facts, likely politicians who are in Juba from Equatoria and in the military may take side in supplying ammunition back to the communities to resist the loss of land, which I identify as the loss of identity. So we don't wish that to happen. And that's why we're calling upon the government to have a quick response that they mitigate these issues and they generate a dialogue that build a better agreement on peaceful coexistence or a framework of when the cattle herders will leave to build trust and confidence between the farmers and the pastoralists that they are coming here temporary, they're not occupying our land, but we are sharing this land as nationals of the same country that we have been struggling together for its independence. So it's a top political issue that require a very decisive decision from the government at all levels. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, I'd like us to go and move on to the situation in the Abre administrative area, whereby there has been a continuous conflict for a number of years now. But as of recent, there's been conflict between the Warab state youth as well as the youth from the Abre region. Uh, can you please briefly discuss that? Yes, there's a, there's a tension coming from uh, the Ngok Dinka and the Twitch Dinka of uh, Warab over a border dispute in an, in an area called Anyeth Market. They fought from the tens until 13 of February and they lost lives and they banned markets and it's becoming tense. The good thing is that president have responded by forming a committee to resolve that. But still, it's the same game of the elites in using tensions among the communities. Even now, boundaries becoming a factor of claiming lives. So huge number of people are displaced from both sides, from Ben Kangok site in Abia and from a Twitch county of Warab Dinka, or they're also displaced. So they're in dire humanitarian need. So it's the same tension like what I was talking about the Magui, is that also in Abia, between Abia and Twitch county, of uh, what up the communities are in classes youth are armed and this tells you very clear if you see the recent visit of AUPs and security council delegation to people the people i'm sorry i've told them that in south sudan youth are armed more than the state army so the state army have no capability to disarm to youth and that's what's happening now between aba and twitch county of uh, Warap, and then 
of uh, uh, of RBA. So the situation is tense. Mm -hmm. um, we wish you success in your upcoming visit to Magu, whereby you'll be meeting with the cattle herders as well as the community members. We hope that the situation can be resolved and a peaceful uh, resolution can come out of it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Edmund Yakani, for joining me here on Beyond the Headlines. Mr. Edmund is the Executive Director of the Community Empowerment for Progress organization. Thank you. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube page at Sunrise Media.